we try to be really open. We try and be really transparent with people. Be honest with people, you know, and that sounds obvious. But I think we've all experienced in the last three years, like we've seen examples where companies they've shied away about being pretty open about some trying things and it's not gone well. Yep. Whereas, you know, we're all adults. Let's treat each other like adults. Trust your people. That's a big one. Also, I'm a big philosophy on. Mm-hmm. Um, and just creating, you know, your role as an owner of a business, CEO of a business, management team, whatever you want to call it, is to create in the environment for your people to be their best. Yep. That's your job. So hello and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by Stuart Wilkinson, who is a CEO of Rightway, who also has a podcast, which strangely <laughs> is named Better Business, Better Life. <laughs> so we're going to be a bit of a, a laugh about that a little bit later on. But um, Stuart has joined us. He, I say, Rightway is actually, um, would you describe it as an accounting firm? Or, yeah, accounting yeah. firm. Yeah, and, accounting and looks firm. up and basically does an outsourced accounting um team for you if you like so Stuart welcome to the show great thank to have you. you yeah it's great to be here Deborah now I asked Stuart what he'd like to talk about and surprisingly he didn't choose to go with <laughs> profit go. or cash flow or any of those things he actually wanted to talk about people yeah so we're going to talk about you know obviously some of the stuff that they do but particularly around the people and the yeah. people issues as well so before we start doing that tell me a little bit about your journey um because you are not an accountant is no that right? I'm not an accountant um yeah. So yeah, Deborah, I've I've been in I guess uh, management and, and and business now sixteen odd seventeen odd years, and I started actually more in sales. Um, so I started as an account manager at a firm called Bartercard, first role out of university, you know, kind of thing, um, and spent ten years there, a great time at Bartercard, and worked my way through um, sort of the hierarchy and the sort of tiers, and then got, that's when I first got into management. So my first role was a branch manager in Auckland Central of Auckland Central team, 15 yep. people, I think it was, 12, 15 people. Yeah. And I loved it. And I thought, you know, this is kind of uh, managing people and teams was kind of thought, this is this is probably my jam. And so worked my way up, um, then became national sales manager for Bardic. I did that for two and a half years. And I thought, oh, probably after 10 years, I need to work maybe somewhere else than just one place in my life. <laughs> and I went to Rightway, which is six years ago now. And I guess why I made the move was a little bit that it was a similar product in the sense it was b2b it was a concept sell you know we're not selling a tangible product or anything um and i felt that you know from an accounting point of view i did a bunch of research that there was a lot of change going on in the industry about then there was kind of the buzzword advisory was on the go yeah right we had a pretty um exciting model it was quite forward looking as a firm at that time and so i came in as a sales manager to help accountants sell which (laughs) accountants are not known for their sales because some of them are actually really really good at it yeah um and so from there, it's been an it's been a an up and down journey at Right. We've had some challenges, had some great stuff, and then two years ago it was I came CEO of Rightway. So wow. yeah, awesome, well done. That, that's a quick sixteen years. It is, you know? isn't it? So what are you most proud of in your professional and personal life? Uh, I guess like professionally, I think there's no doubt. You know, being a CEO of a company is a pretty pretty mm. cool thing. Um, I think you know it was. When I was started to get into upper management at Barca, I thought, yeah, this is kind of where I want to go. I enjoy, you know, more of working through actually the strategy of a business, but then how you take the business through that, you know, mm-hmm. you know, the vision and values and imparting that in your business on the business and your people. And so I thought, well, this is this is kind of where I want to go with my career. So I think when that happened, I was like this is pretty cool, but I'm impatient. So I'm like, well, now what, you know, as a business, where do we keep going? So I think professionally, that was pretty cool. Yep. Uh, personally, you know, I, I think probably, you know, I know it's a bit cliche, but the family's a big part, you know, yep. me and my partner, Desley, we've been together over 13 years. We've got two kids and she's been very patient with me yep. uh, a lot of the time and kept me on an even kill. Um, and look, you, you know, I used to have this, this, this boss and he was always very much, business is business and life your life and then we're never like kind of let the two cross and I, I always struggle with that because your your personal life and your work life whether you're in a business or not they are connected yeah. and there are they and the, the, if something's affecting you at work it will affect you at home and vice versa so I think personally you know I, I say Desley um she'll hate that I'm talking about her like this um <laughs> because I don't think I would have been as successful as I probably have been professionally without without her and and the kids to be honest so yeah they create good balance 
they give you pretty honest feedback <laughs> I'll bet you, you know you know um and and that's needed sometimes so yeah i think that was what i said to my family oh fantastic now we were talking just before the podcast and, and we talked about the journey that right way has been on and it has gone from you know sort of being initially a small kind of business created by two founders that then grew quite large up to 140 staff yeah. at one point throughout yeah. australia new zealand and then it's kind of shrunk back down again but in a good way yeah um, and now you've got about 40 staff in the yeah. business is that right tell us yeah. a little bit about that journey Oh, you said this podcast would be half an hour. Yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's been a hell of a journey. Yeah. And I think what's core, I think, is our founders, um, like I said beforehand, um, they went to the second ever kind of zero con, which is like a zero get together for accountants. It's like a zero party for accountants. <laughs> it is quite good fun, by the way. Is it? You sure? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but they just recognized that cloud technology, you know, the accounting in the cloud in particular, mm -hmm. was going to just change the relationship that an accountant could have with their, with their client. It was not going to be okay, rock into the office in September to talk about last year's tax return, like, mm. which, you know, what use is that? Mm. Actually, we can talk about the present, we can talk about what happened last month and actually add value on an area which most business owners, to be frank, financials is not what they open the business for to be really into the numbers. Mm. So it's an area where we can add as accountants great value, understanding and help in, in short their decision making and where they go, whether that's strategically or even short term. And we've seen that really in particular around COVID yes. and sort of the decision making have become a lot short term. So the, the premise of being able to kind of give more advice and more support, I think, from our founders was is still with us today. But the model we put in place, we grew too quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, we're pretty honest about it now that. Growth is an exciting thing for business, but it can derail businesses if they don't get it right. And for us, we probably didn't get it right. We didn't have the systems and process behind the, the scenes to deliver great work. Um, you know, your clients don't care how many clients you've got. They, they're they the most important. And so they want a consistent delivery. And if you kind of, as you grow, that, that kind of falls by the wayside. Something's not quite right in your systems and process. And that's where we got tripped up. So it was about four years ago. We said, look, we've got to stop growing here. We've mm -hmm. got to start delivering, really sort ourselves out here. And we've had a lot of change within that. Um, so it's been, you know, we've had some pretty tough times, but we've also had some some really good, some some good breakthroughs. And we're in a really good position where we are as now in a business. And we've, and I, you know, and why I picked people is because, it, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. Your people are your business. Yep. But as an accounting industry, you know, to do our work, we need great people. Um, and a lot of the people we have still in the business today have been with us a long time. And we are where we are today because of them. So I think... That's why I thought people would be a good chat for us today. So. Sure. So let's let's talk about people because I mean they are they can make or break a business, isn't that right? Yeah. Um, so how do you get good people? How do you ensure that you're getting the right people? Well, that's in the, in the current market. That's a sixty-four million dollar question, isn't <laughs> yes. it? I think. How do you get good people? I think first of all, uh, like we were talking about this before, like there is some silly numbers salary wise in all industries that are going on at the moment. People are like, oh, just, you know, we'll pay what we need to pay and stuff. And look, don't be wrong. People should value themselves. They should get paid what they're worth. And you need to make sure you're market rate. You can't not be market rate. Mm -hmm. But if that's your only card that you've got to play, you're not going to win because it's becoming very transactional. Actually, the reason they're coming to you, yep. um, because a lot of people say, look, say this, look, doing a set of accounts doesn't matter where you are. Doing a set of accounts doesn't matter if it's that firm or more, uh, right way or another. It's doing a set of accounts. <laughs> yeah. Like it's the same thing. So you've got to think, and most businesses are pretty much the same, you know, especially when you're competitive in industry. So how do you differentiate yourself? Often it comes to the vision, the values of the business and the mm -hmm. purpose that you have. Um, the culture, that's a bit of a, I call it a bit of a buzzword because everyone talks about culture. But the way I describe culture, Deborah, it's not the morning tea. It's actually how you, how do we react as a business, as a team when something's not right? Yeah. I think that's when true culture and organization comes through. So a lot of people, I think, in COVID, when business has been challenged, have probably seen the true colors of, of a business. Mm -hmm. um, so those things create, I think, you know, real purpose of why people want to get out of bed. They didn't get, you know, yeah, you get out of bed to pay the bills. But you actually want to spring out of bed because you're excited what you want to do. You see purpose in your work. You see the results of what you've done for clients, whatever it might be, depending on your business. So mm -hmm. I'm not so pretending I've got the secret source, but I think what, you know, we try to be really clear at, at right way. And I guess my philosophy is a little bit is we try to be really open. We probably be really transparent with people, be honest with people, you know, and that sounds obvious, but I think we've all experienced in the last three years, like we've seen examples where companies that have shied away about being pretty open about some trying things and it's not gone well. Yep. Whereas, you know, we're all adults. Let's treat each other like adults. Trust your people. That's a big one. Also, I'm a big philosophy on. Mm -hmm. um, and just creating, you know, your role 
as an owner of a business, CEO of a business, management team, whatever you want to call it, is to create in the environment for your people to be their best. Yeah. That's your job, you know, and you want them to be able to get whatever it's next, wherever it is they want to progress in their career, they want to be able to take on this next challenge. That might not even be with you. But I often say when people, you know, move for a new opportunity that's outside right way, which we couldn't give them, well, that's a success because we've mm-hmm. geared them up for it. Now, you've got to view yourself like that. So as long as you view yourself like that and then can tell those stories, people want to come work for you because they're like, yeah, I could, I could do all right here. So that's a bit of a ramble, I think. But I think, yeah, in this environment at the moment, look, we're finding it tough. You yep. know, you know, it's it's a really competitive industry. We've got a role at the moment. We've been trying to fill for a couple of months. But um you've got to show your true colors and be open and put your best foot forward. And that's not just about money. It's yeah. my big thing, I'd say. And it's interesting because we, you know, we talk about better business, better life. And it's like, actually, I don't think you're right. Even, even if you're not the business owner, you cannot separate your personal life from your professional no. life. And I think it's important that you're actually able to have those conversations with your people. I remember reading on LinkedIn once, there was this guy who, um, he wasn't achieving what he was meant to be achieving. So he got called into the boss's office and the boss kind of said, you know, what's going on? Mm. Um, and the guy said, look, I'm really, really sorry, but my wife tried to commit suicide last night. It's like, oh my gosh. I mean, that should have been mentioned at the time it happened, not because he Correct. wasn't performing in his job. It's exactly like, right. you've got to remember we're all human beings and yeah. we all have this stuff going on outside our business life that will affect how we perform in the, in the, in, in our business. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right, Deborah. And I think, like, I think one thing that, I think one of the good things about COVID, I think we've fast forwarded quite, quickly on this sort of subject because we've all been in people's living rooms and stuff on mm. zoom calls yep i'll never forget um i won't name her but there was one <laughs> accounting manager and um it was about week two or three i think into lockdown yep and her five-year-old son ran through the back door and her her her, her door was to the room was behind her ran through completely naked her husband was like don't <laughs> mum's on a call and everyone's and she's just like oh my god and so we've all had that kind of those experiences yes. in the last three years mm-hmm. and that does create i think a little bit more trust with an all you know that vulnerability and stuff that we've kind of had of being in people's homes but you know you have got it as an owner of a business you are responsible to make sure that people feel comfortable to speak up now you know when you talk about especially things like mental health and that kind of stuff like that's been a really tricky road for a lot of businesses to to think about how you kind of talk about it and all that sort of stuff but mm-hmm. um there is no doubt you're right like there it shouldn't become after the fact that people should feel comfortable before the fact because you know work performance like i said in the, the intro thing you know my my you know work performance impacts home life and yeah. vice versa and so that balance is really important and it might not be even affecting the person that's in your employment. It might be something in their extended family or whatever. But yeah. And we've got that a little bit in our organization with people that have got people they have to care over after people with you know, diseases and stuff. that You've just got to – people that people like it's okay, like it's life. Mm-hmm. And also, that you know, as, as people that are responsible for business, whether you're owners or CEOs, like, we take a great ownership of what we do. Yeah. Um, but it's a business. It's not life and death half the time. And we sometimes we can get a little bit one eyed about, well, no, we need to do A, B, C and whatever. But we yep. also need to go, well, let's put some balance around some stuff. We, I mean, a lot of the stuff that our people can tend to go through can be a lot more serious than producing a set of accounts as an example <laughs> yes yeah. no it's absolutely true um i was just thinking i don't know if anybody's gonna hear but i've got a dog scratching at the door at the moment it's driving me absolutely insane i don't know if you can hear it on this podcast but i'm gonna ignore it <laughs> it's distracting me though a little bit mm. um yeah i think it, it, it's interesting because in the eos methodology when we have our, our um, level 10 meetings or weekly meetings we actually encourage people to start with professional and personal best and it's really yeah. interesting how much you get to learn about people's life mm. outside of work and and that can just give you such an insight into them that you've got no idea about and yeah. And I think it's really important. And we always talk about like doing what you love with people you love. And it isn't just about the business owners doing what they love people. But I think life is too short. You have to really enjoy what you're doing in yep. a business on a daily basis. You have that ability to to incorporate doing what you love with people you love across the whole business, not just for the business owner. Yeah. yeah. Like one of our values is have fun, um, which yep. Graham, who owns our business, was actually one of the things he came up with because he's like, we spend so much time at uh, work. It might yeah. as well be fun. Yes. And, and it's so simple, but, you know, it's so right. And look, it, not every day is going to be roses. Like, it's just not life like But, you know, it's sh- what we what we say when we have fun. It should be, it links to being a bit meaningful, fun with clients. You yeah. know, like actually being having a relationship where you can have um, a bit of a laugh is important because you spend so much time putting your effort into something, yeah. especially as business owners. Um 
that if it's not fun, then what's the point a little bit? Like mm-hmm. you've got to get so um and and you know, and I think as business owners, as as managers, as leaders, we set the tone at that. Yeah. And I think it's really important that, you know, you kind of open the door. What you do has a big impact on how other people yeah. will act in your business. And I hate to tell you if you don't realize that, but they do. <laughs> yeah. Um I saw this thing actually the other day on TikTok, which we were talking about before. Yes. <laughs> um, and you kind of go, is it real? But I kind of thought it was quite a good message. And it was this guy who was talking about his boss, and he said his boss always left at 5 p.m. Mm. And then he saw him on this long call in the car park. He said, why didn't you just stay in the office? office and take yeah. it? He said, because if I don't leave at five, people won't know it's okay to leave at five. They yeah. look at me. And it's, just, it's whether it's right or not and real, but the premise is right that how you, as a leader, you set the tone. So being like oh, one of the things I thought was really important in lockdown, um, I've got two young kids. I've got a three and a half year old and a one year old. Um that it's you're okay you talk about the struggles of life balance of family and all that sort of stuff to know it's okay so you know you've got to be open and you've got to invite people into your lives if you expect them to be open about their lives a little bit as as leaders um vulnerability i think richard branson says that you know the the number one word that distinguishes great leaders from average leaders is vulnerability you gotta be open and yeah and i think how you act sets the tone for your organization for that and what you accept don't don't accept what you encourage what you don't encourage and you know you know whether you've got a business of 10 people 100 people whatever yep. you set the tone yeah <laughs> um, and the leadership group set the tone and that sort of stuff so i think yeah. it's really important you kind of think about okay well I'm, this is not happening in business so why what am i maybe doing is the first part because it's easy to blame other people because that's mm-hmm. kind of easy yeah but you gotta look at yourself first yeah Okay, so you must have had in, in your time some challenges with maybe people who weren't the right people or or maybe it wasn't that they weren't the right people because they might share the same core values, but maybe they weren't the right in the right job in terms yeah. of what they were doing. How do you work through that? Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, we, we have one of our other values is people matter. Yeah. Um, and the way I in, uh, not interpret it, one of the views, and I talk about this with the business, is I think that's for me is honesty. And look, as... As Kiwis, we kind of we're not the great uh, kind of ooh, confrontation. Oh, that's oh, she'll be all right, mate. Don't you worry. Yeah. Um, and that's often the thing you know. There's we have with staff is okay. Next month they'll be fine or whatever. But I think one you've got to, people need to understand where they sit and how they're performing. And I I I, I can't remember who it's. I read it this thing and I can't remember who it was. Um, and it said if people don't get any feedback, they're entitled to think they're doing a good job. Yeah. And and so your role manager, whatever, you know, you've got to under, you've got to give some good regular feedback, both good and bad, obviously, yeah. of, of improvement of how people are doing. And I think that links to how often you're catching up with your team. Mm-hmm. You know, you talk about Deborah there, your weekly kind of meetings and stuff. Like you should, I'm a big believer. If you're not catching up with your direct reports every week, yep. there's something not quite right there. And people go, oh my god, it's so much time. But it, it's links to my first point that you know, that gives them opportunity for them to kind of raise up. For, and it's not it's not all about you. It's a, all workflow or whatever it is you, got, you do in your business. It's an opportunity for them to spend some time with you for half an hour, an hour. But that's also an opportunity of going, hey, Dave, I spotted this last week. And that might be more behavioral rather than something that's quantifiable like a KPI or whatever. Yep. I just want to chat to you about this. Yeah. Let's just talk about it now. And often these things, if you kind of get ahead of it and they go, actually, sure, I thought about a lot the other night and I knew it wasn't at the best there. Cool. Well, let's just talk to her. We don't make sure that happens again. Yep. It doesn't blow up into something big. Yep. You know what I mean? And well, so, you don't get to the end of the year where they're doing their kind of their final annual oh, performance review and suddenly you go, oh, what? by the way, Stu, you've been yeah. really pissing me off all year and you haven't yeah. done this, you haven't done that. Back <laughs> in eight months ago, <laughs> what? Yeah. You know, annual yeah. appraisals. Don't do annual appraisals. Right. It's a waste of time. Good. Um, yeah. I agree with you there. <laughs> so, so hopefully that wasn't controversial. Nope. Um, you know, it should be frequent. Um, it, but you know it is first it's i guess open communication you know open feedback on on how people are performing yeah um and often that starts the process now if something's starting to go off the rails and it's not work it's not working yeah i'm not the hr advisor you know (laughs) caveat here i'm not hr person so check with your hr professional before doing any of this (laughs) before you come to me but I, i think we build this up into some sort of big crescendo of a meeting and stuff but you know often it's just through good questions can actually find out where so hey dave how are you finding things how is it working and just keep asking questions so you know how is that you know tell me more because often people know yeah. that it's not working now there's sometimes when it's not but 
I think at some point you it is about being honesty and you have to be to the point. It, but I also think um, I'm quite a big fan of Scott Galloway, and he says, look, when there's something you know uh, that's difficult, whether it's a layoff or something's performing, you've got to do it with kindness. Yeah. And I'm a big, I think that's a really good message: is be fair, be kind, but you can't shirk your responsibilities as a manager because you've kind of got both stakeholders here. You're not just there for your stuff; you're there for the good of the business as mm-hmm. well and delivering whatever that is for the business. Um, and so, be honest and be go, hey, look. I'm here to support you, but we need to see improvement here. And yeah. look, I, you know, I've had it with the performance management staff, and some of that is through you know more of a KPI thing. Some of it's more on behavioural and value stuff. Um, and often it's the decision point for that employee where they go. Often, you know, my experience they don't carry on from, through that part, yeah. but most of them have ended in a really amicable way. Going actually, this isn't right for me. Yeah. So. And I think it's important. We've got to remember that just because they're not right for you doesn't mean they won't fit in somewhere else. Correct. And I was having a really interesting conversation with somebody the other day where they're actually saying, you know, I wish people would be more honest about their values because not all businesses are all about having fun and people first. There are some that are dog eat dog. You know, think about working in the, um, what do you call it, the, the Wall Street, you know, those kind of yeah, environments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's actually a pretty nasty environment. Correct. And people who thrive in it are actually people who really get off on that kind of behavior. Correct. Everyone for themselves, eat man, you know, man, eat man, all that kind of stuff. So it's like, actually, if we were really honest about it, just they don't fit in with us, does not mean they're not going to fit in somewhere else. It, and it, then they can be happy somewhere else. It, exactly right. And I think, um, and I think, you know, COVID's been a really interesting thing as we've worked more remotely versus less in the office. Obviously, we're kind of getting that balance back a little bit more now. Yep. But I think what we saw is some people, they they are super organized and so working from home. They can manage more than, you know, the family, blah, blah, blah. And yep. it's, they're brilliant at it. Some people struggled um, and it didn't work. They need the office. They need the accountability of the office. They need the ability to separate. Okay, I'm going out of my home and I'm into my office and mentally at work. So it's not just, there's a number of things as you said, Deborah, that can mean just because they're not good for you. It might be actually it's, the environment, the environment and how, as you said, how you work because businesses do operate in different ways. Yeah. Um, and so that's got a big bearing on how, if they're going to be successful or not with you. Mm. Oh, working from home thing is really fascinating because I mean, I must admit, so, so my husband's an actuary. So we're like, you know, oh, if you took yeah. every single part of the spectrum, we're on opposite ends of, of everything, especially risk taking. Um, but yeah, so he, you would think that in the lockdown, he would actually be really happy working from home yeah. because he plays on spreadsheets with numbers, he's in front of a computer all day long. He hated it. He absolutely hated it. Interesting. Eh? He liked going into an office. He liked the structure of going into an office, talking to people when he was in the office. Mm. Me, on the other hand, I was actually sort of reasonably happy because I still had Zoom calls. I could still catch up with yeah, people. Yeah, I didn't me in the slightest yeah um but so yeah it just depends on what people want and i must admit i'm looking for a new um assistant at the moment so i can integrate mm. a such assistant mm. and part of my requirement is actually you have to work from the office yeah because i'm the kind of person who likes having somebody in here with me that i can yeah you know, bounce around ideas and things with rather than having to schedule a zoom call to have a chat about something now of course we still have structured meetings but i just like having people around me so uh, yeah but that links back to how you work isn't it and yeah. i think being reopened really through your recruitment process talking about culture i remember i i do this thing um with aut called follow a Le- follow a leader for the day where oh, you yeah. get um uh, a second year uh, student at aut often normally in a commerce sort of type of degree and you get a final year uh, uh high school person yeah and they come and follow you for a day of what's it like to be a ceo mm-hmm. and i remember we did this meeting this was the, the, the second the session i did two years ago with them and we had it, and they got invited. They were in our management meeting, and they were like, "Oh, this is quite cool." Yeah. And we were, and we were recruiting some a role at the time. I can't remember what it was, and we were kind of just kind of updating people, all that updating the rest of the the team on how that was going, type of candidates we're seeing. Mm-hmm. And and one of the guys came. He says, "You didn't speak about the technical stuff at all." Yeah. And I was like, "Oh no, no, we don't know. No, yeah, what do you mean?" And he said. <laughs> you just ask about their values and how they fit with the team is and their culture. And I was like, yeah, because if they don't fit it, like they could be the best account in the world, yeah. but if we're not right for them and uh, we're not right for, for, for them, vice versa, it ain't going to work. Yeah. And, and so I do think, you know, when you look at your recruitment process, we have a technical interview and then we have a culture interview yeah. in our process. So, you know, as business owners, as leaders, what, what are you doing around culture? I know we see this, my, other, uh, my previous company I work with, we would get them in between the first and second interview to do like, not a peer interview, but they'd sit with some of the staff for like just 10 minutes, 15 minutes ago. Cause I had this big thing. I never wanted someone the first day to go, well, this is not what I signed up to. So, you know, and look, a bit more remote now, it's a bit difficult, but you know, you've got that way. If you get a recruitment, right. 
you've got a much higher chance you're not going to have to unless we have these conversations, but mm-hmm. situations change. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about accounting now because, you know, we've talked about the people, <laughs> which is great. We've learned a lot about the people side, which is really cool. But, I mean, from an accounting point of view, you mentioned the, in the beginning, and we talked about it before, advisory. So, you know, accountants mm. have kind of gone, oh, we need to get into advisory. Yeah. But what does that really mean? And what is it the right way does that actually helps people in that yeah. advisory space yeah and no, i like yeah and your most people listen to this podcast if you're business owners your, your, your accountant will be talking to you sometime i imagine advisory some people don't and that's yep. cool um we the, the words we put around it is called plan build perform and you know having a plan build towards it and then obviously a bit of and performing it about how against that plan and, and you're going so that's our philosophy but it's kind of layered for a lot of accountants, it starts with financial advisory, and what we 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 term that is is first of all education. What what are these numbers telling us? What does this mean? Yep. How do we use this to help our decision making process? It's not the only factor that makes decisions. Obviously, accountants will believe that numbers are the only reason you things you should look <laughs> at, but you're not. But you know they they're a huge indicator of okay, what's worked, what's not worked. Yep. Um, as I describe it, it's the result sheet from, you know, it's like the school report, it's a result sheet. Yeah. So let's use that to go, okay, we did better here or we didn't do as well here. Well, let's understand why. And it's something in your business, whether it's a process, whether it's people, whether it's the type of customer you've got, whether it's your market, give me a number of things. Yep. But it's it's that window into, okay, well, I want to do X. Well, okay, if we want to improve that by 5%, what do we need to do in the business? So it's, it's just, it's a really good marker. And I think your accountant now, They've got with cloud technology, we use zero for all our clients. You can get information into into you know if you compare to what the account, accounting systems and stuff even ten years ago, even zero, yeah. you, you're miles ahead of what you can do. You know profitability by ch- sales channel. You know what are my top clients spending with me? Mm-hmm. That gives you some growth. I remember I sat with a client and they're like, oh my top clients spending less than I go yeah maybe you go visit them he's like oh we'll do that you know, just <laughs> yeah. simple and so some, of, that, the business some of that's a little bit tactical but it, it is a window so for us I think it's that's the first layer of understanding then being able to inform decision making and then hopefully that ends into okay as a plan we've got a bit more information to help us kind of make a f- informed plan and then strategy for our business because we were saying this before Deborah like Whatever you as a business owner want to do, um, whether it's retire when you're 50, put your daughter through university, you know, invest in buying another business, the business has got to do something. Yeah. And whether that's time, financial, whatever. So having a chat with your accountant, involving them in that process can be super useful because they they can help you with that and actually start to go, okay, to do that, we need this thing financially to happen. Let's talk then, whether it's with us or whether it's someone else that helps with your strategy um someone like yourself deborah can actually go well hey now we kind of know where we need to get to yeah on your personal goal business goal we've got the numbers to help understand what that looks like so i think advisory is it's a it's a buzzword mm-hmm. and an overused term i oh, would suggest and the clients don't understand <laughs> what it is yeah um so the we've recently come up with this term plan build before when you talk to clients like oh, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense but yeah. that can come down right to right sort of tactical stuff in the next six months that some clients want to do might they be like me an immediate issue we kind of identified and that can even just be tax stuff well let's put a plan together let's build towards it and then measure if we've got success on it so it's mm-hmm. kind of philosophy yep. um but you know if your account is not to, uh, i think about you know a simple term that, we, that a lot of accounts now use in this advisory about the future yep. well, we want to talk about the future if you can't just talking about it about the past get a new account <laughs> fair, fair enough and so you've now got a team of people who will actually provide all of the accounting services right right the way from the yeah. bookkeeping through to the yeah, analysis the fun- of numbers and planning mm. and performing okay yeah cool Okay, so what are your you you come armed with top tips, didn't you? This is this is I have to say, Stuart's one of my most prepared podcast guests. He's brought his um, iPad and he's got everything written down. Love it. <laughs> I've, already, I've kind of actually already talked about some, but um, yeah, but let's repeat them. I think it's always yeah. worthwhile. So, yeah. Uh, my first tip: put yourself out of job. Um, and what I mean by that, as mm. a business owner, you know, when you create your business, you had a you saw a hole, or you were really good at something like you, you know, you were good in hospa, or you were a really good sign maker, or whatever, or you saw an opportunity. Mm-hmm. What that lends to is you kind of that's your craft, that's your trade, that's what you're good at. Even if you're in the tech side, you're a good software uh, developer, whatever it is. Yep. But the only way you're going to grow your business is actually putting yourself out of a job. You can't be ever. I think yeah. you see so many, and you would see this, Deborah. You see so many clients that have hit a ceiling. And that's not necessarily revenue ceiling, but a ceiling of capacity, a ceiling mm-hmm. of how they manage their team, where they're trying to be everything for everyone. Yep. 
you've employed people for a reason. Let them do their job. And then also trust, get good partners around you. You know, I'll, I'll use bookkeeping as an example. The amount of clients, oh, no, we'll do our own bookkeeping. One, you won't be as good as our own bookkeepers. No. Two, you'll be slower than our own bookkeepers. And three, you, why? Just get someone else to do it because you should be focused on what you are good at and growing your business. So, yeah. so you know, surrounding yourself with good partners is a way of doing that. But you should be like, why am I involved in this process? You know, whether it is, I always do the sales credit. Now that might be okay for a period of time, but what happens if you get hit by a bus? What happens if you want to go on holiday? Yeah. Whatever it is. Who else is there someone else you start to bring in um, to help you with quoting? You let them take the reins. And often as the business owner, no one does it as good as me. Well, no, because you own the business and you've done this for 10 years and they've been with you for two years and you care a lot more about it than they will. Let's be frank about that. Yeah. But put the system. It's good enough, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's about system and process. What are the system process and your sales process so that the, you know you feel comfortable to start quoting some of the smaller jobs, whatever it might be. But mm. You've got to keep having mentality. I have it in my job. How do I put myself on out of a job so that I, if you're involved in everything, mm -hmm. that's not a functioning business? No. You know, there's always me stuff you have to approve or whatever, but really constantly look at it. And some of that, you know, develops with growth and different stages, but that's my first tip. And I think it also applies not only if you want to continue running the business and break through in that ceiling, but if you want to sell the business, you cannot sell it if it's all reliant on you. Correct. And so you've got to let that stuff go. And you think, I always got the $25 an hour work. Um, I'm absolutely with you. I mean, I can do bookkeeping. I actually can do my account and my GST, <laughs> but in reality, I'm not very good at it. Um, I do make mistakes and I can actually command a much higher rate. So I think most business owners Correct. underestimate what their hourly rate kind of genuinely is. And you kind of go, right, I can pay somebody $25 five fifty dollars an hour to do that exactly and i can go right. out and earn a thousand dollars an hour doing this it's a no-brainer right exactly right and you know start with i use bookings for something i, I know but it could yep. be marketing or whatever but put the checks and balance you feel comfortable with and look there's a bit of you know ooh, a bit of yeah. a bit of taking a leap but you know when you're finding a partner ask for references do all that kind of good stuff you need to do but really question how you spend your time and is it is it on the high value activities is it the things that are really important to move your strategy forward because I, I imagine you see this all the time but, oh they come up with a great plan and strategy what have you been doing oh i've been caught up with that job and whatever Fighting well fires, you yeah. know and well at some point you have to do that you yeah. know you have to put out time and and that is important for you to get whatever it is you want to do in your business that's my first tip perfect fully on the same page there outsource delegate and elevate correct oh i like yeah that's good that's <laughs> yeah. good um I, i've always talked about it so i went but i you set the tone for your organization mm -hmm. so and i you know i use that example of the, the boss leaving at 5 p.m you know, simple things. It, don't email your staff yeah. late at night. You know, things like that, which you go are small, but all the one percenters add up to a lot for an organization mm -hmm. and that will set the tone. So that's my other one. And just, just quickly, I want to cover that because I think it's something I've been guilty of in the past because, you know, I think as a business owner or even as a CEO, you're not switched off from the business at any point. So no, you might wake up with something you want to deal with it. Um, there is a function on Outlook where you can send it later, which I've had to start using because yep. otherwise I send it. And it, I don't expect them to respond, but sadly they expect that they should respond Correct. because the boss has sent it. So you have to do something with it. Exactly yep. right. So I think how you conduct yourself every day yep. and and yeah as i said before you condone and encourage different behaviors and a lot of that's uh the non-verbal stuff and mm. that you might do um so i think it's really important you think about that in an organization and think well this isn't quite working well and all the way i want and that could be culturally operation whatever start yourself okay what am i doing am i my links my kind of first point am i the yep. bottom like am i involved how am i conducting myself around that mm -hmm. you might need probably someone externally to kind of help you a little bit like that as i said your husband and wife's pretty good normally <laughs> yeah. but it, it you know looking in the mirror it can be really tough you know really these confronting. 360 stuff or whatever if you've ever done that it's really confronting but it's really powerful really powerful if you're in the you know and, and i think link with that as a business owner, you are a leader of the organization. Mm. You've got to understand that. Um, I know some people don't realize that, but you are leading a, a bunch of people trying to achieve something. And just because you own the business doesn't mean they'll do it. Yeah. So there's more than that. So that's my other yep. one. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, this is one thing I've done recently, and a big shout out to Dave Jags. He's one of our business partners. Who uh, He's an ex. He used to own uh, a gym and physio business um, before he joined us. Right. And one of the things, and we've both got young kids. And so I was, I was quizzing Dave. I said, Dave, how do you manage to stay healthy with all this stuff? And he said, I had a client, Stu, um, and they were really um, up there lawyer and were like, you know, smashing out the hours. 
And so the one thing they talked about is, you know, your your exercise is the first thing you do each day. It has, to, uh, and if because otherwise it'll get shifted. And so you've got to have a priority. So he said, so what I've started doing, and I'm not going to be one of those CEOs like, oh, I wake up at 4 a.m. But because I've got young kids, so I uh, three times, a, uh, and I've done it now for a month. So it's pretty recent. Good. I wake up at five, and I do it go from a run. I used to run lots because I've got three and a one year old, and I, there's lots that happen with those um, <laughs> and a and a job. The reason I say that is you've got to look after yourself. Yeah. Um, and if you're, you know, you've got a big response for your business, you will know that. But if you're not functioning, and we're never, we're not always function 100%, don't get me wrong. But if you're not doing something for you, mm. it ain't good. And so um, so Dave's advice was, you know, either have it in your calendar and it's non-negotiable that yeah. it gets touched. So whether you want to go out to the gym at lunchtime. And he said, it's not necessarily exercise. It could be meditation. It could be reading a book. It could be anything. But you've but got to do Time for you. Time for you. Yeah. Um, but if you if you know things get shifted in the day, you have to do it first. Mm-hmm. And you have to work out a way. And I must admit, I've done it now for a month. Um, I used to do a lot more running before the kids and lockdown and stuff. Um, it's been brilliant for me. Yeah. It's been good for mental health, good for my thought process, sets me up well for the day. So that's my other piece of advice. And I, I'd agree. I mean, we get up at about 5.30 most mornings and just go for a walk with the dogs yeah. and cycle with the dogs. And and for me, it is actually my thinking time as yeah, well. Yeah, massively. Um, and the days that I can't, it's a day I wasn't able to do it because I had a very early podcast in the morning. Um, it was actually, you know, I don't feel as good throughout the day because there's that vitamin D that you get yeah. from kind of being out there. I don't know, there's a whole range of things that yeah. really helps set you up well for the day. Yeah. So you miss it when you don't do it. Yeah. yeah. And, and my last one, so I got, I've, 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 I've asked for four, um, you know, as we're accounting firm, I was going to say accounting firm, and you know, I gave asked for three, you gave me four. Well, I like it. Good counting, eh? I like with accountants. There's always a way of making the numbers work. Um, <laughs> if you, I know this sounds really obvious, and especially over the last three years, understand your cash flow intimately. And right. what I mean by that is, on a monthly basis, what is your cycle of cash flow? What goes in? What goes out? And literally plot it on a whiteboard, whatever it might be. You know, you can can we help you with this? Yep. But cash flow is the lifeblood of your business you can have the best ideas in the world you can have the best initiatives you can execute them but if, it, if you've not got cash flow there's a problem yeah. so really understanding your ups and downs the movements tax um it is a point one people forget about it um, mm-hmm. but really understanding that often 90 days is a good really good window depending on the type of industry and your payment terms and that kind of stuff but really get into it because because yeah. there's probably some unlock there for you which takes some pressure off there's probably some profitability as well in even in your cash flow. So we've done that with a number of clients. We get a big white ball. We put all the time payment terms and all that sort of stuff. And there is always wins. So right. I just really encourage all clients, business owners, just sit there. If you need some help, can go and have a chat to them and just say, I want to understand my cash flow cycle really on top of it. And there might be stuff you go, cool, I get it. And that's yep. there's no surprise, but at least you now know. Mm-hmm. Um, but also there might be some stuff you go, ooh. That client mm. never pays me on time and never has. Well, and it's so he's got an extra fifteen days. Well, what do you do there? You know, it's a big client. Is there a ways you can get that cash in the door? You know, simple things, but just having a bit of an understanding of cash flow intimately. Yep. is really important. I think I did it recently around software because I don't know about you, but I signed up for apps and software left, right, and centre. And of course, all software as a service, they've all got a monthly fee. Oh, it's only twenty bucks, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's only five ninety nine. And the amount of the amount of different streaming channels for TV we've got Correct. at home Correct. that all just cost five ninety nine, twelve yeah. ninety nine. And so on my whiteboard that says in the office, I literally wrote out every single piece of software. It is horrendous yep. how much money I have been paying on things. And you have to make the call and go, Am I actually really using yep. it? Does it really give value, or is yeah. it not worthwhile doing? Exactly. So the same with the cash flow in the business, right? If you're still looking at it um, as a holistic point of view, you'll get some insights. Yeah, what's and it'll be and it'll just be simple as like that. You go, oh, I didn't realize it yeah. because five dollars of this, and before you know, there's a thousand bucks. And you, yeah, and so whether it's once a year, whatever, but just make sure you've got an understanding of what's going on in your cash flow and the cycles of it, because there's lots of variables, lots of key points where things can go wrong, especially if you've got a product led business where you might be importing. We all know about the supply mm-hmm. chain issues yeah, getting yeah. a bit better, obviously. <laughs> yes. you know, you, you, as I say to clients, you don't want to be the bank for someone else, yeah. you know? So how do you make sure that works really well for you? And then that's obviously can help with conversations. So if you know your cash flow intimately helps mm-hmm. conversation with your bank, because if you're informed, they're more confident with you yeah. as well. So that's my other final tip. No you cash okay, flow. thank you. Four, four out of three tips. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so if people want to get a hold of you, apart from obviously the the podcast. So tell us a little bit about your podcast, The Better Business, Better Life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It came out of COVID. Yeah. yeah like we, um, as I said, Deborah, like we kind of were just, the phones were off the hook in that first couple of weeks of lockdown yeah. and we just 
How do we, and it was, you know, all that time when there was so much information from the government, wage subsidy, there was some tax stuff and all those sort of things. So we said, let's just do some podcasts. It was really for clients just to get really kind of, really kind of rich content, really informative uh, way of kind of keeping people informed regularly in a way we could get out kind of quickly. More, yeah, to more people. And, and so it's kind of ebbed and flowed over its time, but it's been going three odd years now. Um, and it just works really well. It, like it's kind of, as I said, there's some of the mundane stuff is the ones that go really well. Like what is prof tax? Because people go, yeah, I don't really know that. And so <laughs> yeah. it's a really good way of kind of bringing a better life. And it's kind of, so it's quite good. So it is called, it's got a great title. Uh, it's called a better life, better, a better business, better life podcast as well. So if you, if you search, what's the beauty of this? Yeah. Yeah. It's if you search every podcast. Our podcast will be next door to each other, so Isn't you can just wonderful? like both at the same time. But I don't have a T-shirt like yours. Oh, so I know. I don't, those who can't see, it's actually got, it's got the, the zero, um, the zero the logo. logos and, and, and then the better, better business, better life on the T-shirt as well. So yeah, that's awesome. so, um, so that's our podcast. But <laughs> yep. uh, if you want to get her right way, uh, rightway.co.nz. Now, right way, just spell that because there's two different ways. Oh, yeah, yeah, so we're R- at R-I-G-H-T-W-A-Y.co.nz. Yep. And um, all our contact details are on there. Sure. Um, or you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, which I think the link, link will be in the podcast. Yep, and it's Stuart um, with a U. Stuart with a U, um, <laughs> yeah. and you can reach out to me there. Oh, fantastic. Hey, look, thank you so much for Thanks, coming Deborah. in, sharing your time. Really appreciate it. Some really great tips in there. Um, not what I was expecting from an accountant, and actually quite <laughs> a lot of fun. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay, talk to you soon. See ya. Bye.